Hi, Moedim Lusimcha, Chagim Luzmanim Lusasson. It's Thursday, Chola Moed Pesach, Erev, Erev, Shabbat, Erev, Erev, the last, well, we here in Israel, the last day of uh, Pesach. Uh, for those of you in Chutzlar, it's, it'll be, uh, you'll have uh, Sunday, Shabbat and Sunday. And uh, we are actually going north to go visit family, uh, to actually to go visit my daughter who lives in Haifa, so that um, I'm doing this a day early. The um, central feature of the last day of Pesach is um, marked by the uh, Torah reading that we'll read, and that is the crossing of the Red Sea or the Reed Sea um, in the last act of the liberation of the Jewish people from of the Israelites from uh, from Egypt. Um, it's a very very striking and stunning formative event in uh, Jewish collective memory. Uh, Kriyat Yam Suf, the splitting of the sea, uh, really pops up in all kinds of different places, all kinds of unusual places. Would have would have thought. Um, in the uh, in, rabbin, in rabbinic literature and in biblical literature, uh, one of the more uh, interesting ones, which one could uh, actually spend some time, uh, a lot of time thinking about, but which I'm not going to uh, go on to go into right now, is uh, the very end, is an enigmatic statement made by the Talmud in the beginning of Tractate Sota, that Kashim Zivugim La Kadosh Baruch Hu Kikriyat Yam Suf, that it's that the God finds um, uh, making pairing off. Um, uh, making making shiduchim, pairing off uh, men and women for marriage, as difficult as splitting the Red Sea. Now, the truth of the matter is, what does that mean? I mean, what's difficult for God? So, does that mean that uh, he finds uh, he finds uh, making matches to be uh, to be easy, or uh, we should think of how momentous uh, the splitting of the sea was, and therefore uh, relate to uh, relates matches that way? It's it's interesting it's a topic for discussion. Uh, but uh, that's not for now. Um, what I would like to um, emphasize in the, in the brief remarks now uh, are a couple of uh, other points. Uh, point number one is that um, we don't make, we don't pay enough attention to the fact that the splitting of the sea really was a very, very central part of Jewish national collective memory. Um, it's, it's very striking that um, it stood alone uh, and unique in, uh, in the way that commentary, commentators, both Kabbalistic and philosophic, uh, addressed it. Um, it, uh, it somehow towers over all of the other biblical miracles, for example. The um, excuse me, the um, medieval philosophers and modern philosophers who have a tendency to um, try to minimize the number of uh, miracles that one takes literally. literally. Uh, for example, in the Middle Ages, philosophers um, tended to, if you, to try to minimize the number of uh, deviations from natural law that um, are really accepted. A lot of the cases you have miracles in the Bible that are interpreted allegorically, in other words, that they, they didn't really happen, but they meant to lead, teach a uh, lesson, um, or, uh, or they're interpreted naturalistically. Uh, and when it comes to both striking, when it comes to Kriyat Yam Suf, when it comes to the uh, splitting of the sea, uh, that never happens. It's somehow the splitting of the sea, as uh, as majestic and as um, really out of the course of natural events, as it was, uh, they don't they, they, they don't touch it, which is um, a little, somewhat surprising. So what what sets it apart from all other biblical miracles that we, that this one we don't we don't uh, we don't try to naturalize this one we don't question what was it about that experience what is it about the way that that generations related to it that uh, sort of put it outside of um, outside of the realm of all other miracles that are recounted in the Bible and Talmud. Um, I think there are a number of different possibilities for this. Um, number one, and this is a theme which comes up much more um, when we discuss the splitting of the sea in its normal context. In other words, when we get to the fourth um, parasha, the fourth uh, Torah reading in uh, in the book of Exodus, um, the week that we read the story of um, 
at the crossing of the sea and the song that was sung afterwards. Uh, that's Parshat B'Shalach, which usually pops up sometime in January. Um, we call that Shabbat Shabbat Shira. Uh, because the uh, song of the sea, the, the song that is uh, was sung by Moses and the children of Israel according to, according to the Bible, um, that song is the prototype for all subsequent song. Uh, interestingly, uh, through the ages, the um, even though it wasn't originally part of the, the prayer service, there is a very clear uh, attempt to um, sort of intuitively bring that bring the song of the sea into the daily prayer service because somehow prayer would be daily prayer would be um, deficient if we didn't invoke this original um, this original ecstatic song that was attributed to Moses and the children of Israel at the at the sea. Uh, there's a really remarkable example of how this works uh, that is told in the 13th century by a um, excuse me by a famous uh, rabbi in Vienna whose name was Yitzchak ben Moshe, uh, and he recalls he has an older tradition that in the uh, late 10th early 11th century uh, it was not accepted, saying reciting the uh, reciting the, um, the, song, the Kriya Shirat Hayam, the Song of the Sea, uh, was not part of the Ashkenazic uh, prayer service, as it is today at the end of the preliminary psalms called Psuket Zimra. But a rabbi came from Rome, from Italy. Those of you who know me know that that's, that's already exciting. Um, that a rabbi came from Italy and said, no, our practice is to say it, and we think we, you should say it. And the uh, Ashkenazi Jews accepted that, insistence on the part of this uh, on this rabbi. Now, uh, scholars are usually take this story to um, exemplify the authority that this one uh, Rav, whose name was Rabbi de Mishulam, um had for the, his, new, uh, his new community. He moved from Rome to uh, Mainz, to Mackenzie. Uh, but the flip side of that is that there must have been something in Shirat Hayam which spoke to the people and which opened up the possibility that they would change their liturgy and include something new, uh, which is a remarkable thing by itself because the truth of the matter is that German Jews, Ashkenazi Jews in general, are profoundly, have always been profoundly conservative. They don't like any kind of changes whatsoever. And here, this the Johnny come lately from Italy said, no, I think we sh our practice is to do this and you should do that, which indicates the fact that they were, they were receptive to the idea, not just because some, some, some famous rabbi said something. They say, okay, so he said something. We don't do that way. But rather, but they accepted it, meaning that the idea that one should include the song at the sea in the liturgy answered some kind of spiritual need of the community. They recognized its value, which raises the question, what is its value? What is it about the, the experience of, or the memory of the splitting of the sea? And what is it the, um, what is it that the song itself um, evokes? in those who recite it, which uh, would lead to this kind of a um, change, in a, as I said, in a very profoundly conservative uh, community. Um, I think the answer, so the end, the answer to that will, is provided by the, un, the other emphasis of the significance of the crossing of the sea, which is more uh, evident um, on the seventh day of Pesach when we sort of relive it. Um, so what did the what did the uh, what did the splitting of the sea indicate? So number one, in Jewish memory, uh, the splitting of the sea was not just a moment of getting away from Pharaoh's chariots, which is the way it's portrayed in Prince of Egypt, or the way it's portrayed in the Ten Commandments. Um, it was a moment of democratic um, theophany. God reveals Himself equally to everybody in a massive display of his power, and the kind of unmediated God experience that the Israelites um, received or underwent was unparalleled. The Talmud itself says that Rata Yechazkel ben Kohen, that the, the lowliest maidservant, the average person at the splitting of the sea, um, had an insight, it had an experience of the divine which transcends that which was given to the prophet Ezekiel. And that's really quite, that's quite a, it's quite a statement because the truth of the matter is that Ezekiel's 
prophecies, especially the first two chapters, are the basis for all mystical uh, illumination in Judaism. It's called Maseh Merkava or Soda Merkava. And nevertheless, as high as as high a degree, as high a level as he went, as he attained, nevertheless, it's not it the whatever whatever it was that they had. Uh, it was nothing compared to uh, the average person. So, number one, the importance of the splitting of the sea was a matter of the fundamentally democratic nature of the access of God uh, to God, and the fact that the lowliest um, the lowliest maidservant can, in fact, have as direct and as powerful a um, as profound a relationship with God as um, as a, as the most sublime prophet. So. That's number one. And when you consider the fact that there's a fundamentally democratic element to Yitzhak Mitzrayim, to the Exodus in general, that fits. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, the, um, the experience of the splitting of the sea uh, was, I'm sorry, please uh, excuse me for saying this, it was, um, it was the great divide. It was the great divide between an earlier life and their later life. By crossing the sea, the... Um, the Jews, re- the Israelites, really left Egypt. The Israelites really were now on their own. The Israelites left behind the um, all of the uh, culture and civilization and the cultural context of their life in Egypt, which is the only life they had to go into the desert, which is tabula rasa. It's totally blank, and to continue their their um, their path to their new and transformative. Uh, religious identity, which will be provided in uh, another uh, six and a half weeks or so, uh, on Shavuot with the coming, with the re- with the giving of the Torah. The Torah was given in the desert because it had to be given in a brand new um, blank slate situation, which the, which the Israelites basically create a, their own sacred canopy, or God provides them with a new sacred canopy, which is a direct contrast to that which they had left and to that to which they will be going when they enter into uh, the land of Canaan. So that the, um, there is something very final and something very powerful about the leaving, the crossing of the sea, because you basically, um, you're ba- this is really the act, one, act, one part of the act of liberation. Uh, the Jews, if you want, are born, really, on the, uh, when they emerge from the sea, and if you want to see it as an act of birth, literally, because you're leaving from the waters, uh, the waters part, not unlike the way that they, um, the baby is born. You would certainly be uh, be right to do so. Uh, there's a third. Po- there's a third lesson uh, involved in the um, in this um, in the significance. Uh, at least another th- lesson involved in the significance of the splitting of the Red Sea, and that insight is provided by a uh, someone who I studied with studied many years ago. Um, his name was Rabbi Eliezer Ashkenazi. Eliezer Ashkenazi himself was a very interesting individual. He was the uh, grandson, or the great-grandson, sorry, of a uh, well-known uh, Italian rabbi whose name was Yosef Colon, who I, about whom I wrote my doctorate. Uh, he wandered, he, he was born in Alexandria in Egypt, and he came to Famagusta, and from Famagusta he went to, back to Italy, and from Italy he ended up in Poland. He really, was, he really touched all of the, all, many of the major bases of Jewish life in the 16th century. And he wrote a wonderful commentary on the Bible, on the Chumash, called Ma, uh, Maase, Maase Hashem, the Deeds of God. When he comes to discuss the um, meaning of the uh, splitting of the sea and of the song, he zooms in, he hones in on one word, which is quite striking, in the run-up to the recitation of the song at the sea by Moses and the people. It says, Vayosha, Vayosha Hashem et Yisrael me Mitzrayim, Vayar Yisrael Mitzrayim, Meitzel Svat Hayam. God saved, he, he provided a salvation for Israel because, or, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the shore. Uh, says Rabbi Eliezer Ashkenazi, he said, you know, that word doesn't appear in the four languages of redemption that uh, are actually responsible for the four cups that we drank at the Seder, or at the Sterim, depending on where you're listening to this. Um, there you have, and I, I will save you, and I will redeem you, and I will take you, and I, all kinds of stuff. But I will save you in the sense of a salvation, by Yosha, Yeshua, which is a much more powerful and much more transcendent moment 
of, uh, of redemption, that, that word is not invoked. Specifically here, in this verse, the Torah uses the word Vayosha. So what was unique, something, there was something unique about the moment after the, after the Israelites had crossed the sea that caused the Torah to use this uh, very, very powerful term. Said, and so Rabbi Lezer Ashkenazi said, um, it's very simple. It's very simple. When a person runs away from something, whether they run away from jail, or when a, escape, when a slave escapes, they're never really free. They're never really free. They may be physically free. They may be able to do whatever they want, but in the back of their minds, they're always afraid. They're always looking over their shoulder, lest the master, lest the police try to get them. They're never totally liberated. When the Israelites saw the Egyptians dead, and the sea had closed, and they saw them, they confronted their past, only then could they be free. Only then could they really turn around and go forward with their heads high, <clears throat> with their heads high, and, and start the march to Sinai, knowing that they didn't have, nobody was chasing them, that all they had to do was push themselves forward to a, glorified, to a glorious future. That is a true Yeshua. That is a true salvation. So that in a real sense, Jewish history, yes, the process begins with the Exodus from Egypt. The process begins with the night of the night of awe, the night of the terrible night of, of terror which the Egyptian firstborn dies. All of that is very true. But the real salvation begins when they are no longer worried about having to, to have concerned about having to look behind, look back and they can just look walk, walk forcefully and strong and and with uh, and with courage and with confidence and belief into their future so all of those together uh, I think underlie the um, underlie the um, centrality of the formative of the formative impact that the memory of the splitting of the sea had for Jews I think that that's one of the reasons why the first real song the first the first poem of praise of God to be found in the Bible is then, because you can't really forcefully and sincerely and freely um, praise and sing and rejoice if you're always looking over your shoulder. You can't really celebrate until you look at your past and you free yourself from it and say, ah, oh, now I'm a free person. Now I can celebrate. And all other songs, all other songs of praise, the Psalms, whatever the case might be, are all predicated upon that idea. So that starts at that moment. That's the reason why Pesach, I, I think it helps to understand why Pesach is seven days, because you need to, the Torah needed to include that seventh day, the day on which they, they cross the sea, as part of the, as part of the holiday. Otherwise, it's sort of like you have the first day and then like it all drags out. But the answer is no. The process isn't ended. The first stage isn't ended until we cross the sea together. Uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik would say that that's when the uh, covenant, covenant of fate, of common historical death, of common historical fate, was um, finalized. And so, on this um, on this uh, coming Shabbat, we will have uh, we will mark all that the uh, crossing of the sea stands for, the um, equal relationship of God to every single individual Jew the democratic nature and the intense nature of the revelation at the time, the fact that um, there was a st cultural statement in which we walked, the Israelites walked out of one cultural and civilizational context into a blank slate to be able to, and started the march to Sinai, to be able to um, receive the Torah and so that we could, we could start developing our civilization. And number three, that the crossing of the sea, that that was made possible by the fact that we were able to look at the those who had enslaved us before and realize that we didn't have anything to fear from anymore from our past. We could march forward with courage and fortitude and confidence on the way to Sinai and from Sinai to Eretz Israel. Moedim Simcha. Chag uh, Sameach, and uh, we will see you hopefully uh, next week.